Hello everybody, thank you for tuning in. In this video, you're gonna see a couple different things. You are gonna see a, a, an in-depth analysis of some big O hands and hand review is actually gonna start right up here. So if you want, you can just skip right ahead to it. Uh, a couple of uh, things in this video, we are gonna see a little bit of Vegas shenanigans. I happened to bring my brother along with me on this trip. We nicknamed him Flounder. Uh, he is not a poker grinder at all. He actually uh, uh, owns his own company and is very comfortable in semi-retired. He still works, but uh, the reason why we brought him along uh, is because uh, he's, first of all, he's really fun to be around. But um, we wanted an outsider's perspective on poker and poker tournaments. So he plays his very uh, first Omaha game ever in a $600 08 tournament, which is pretty hilarious because if you watch it, you'll see what the results are. Um, I'll give you a hint. He beats both me and Donkfish in the tournament. Um, so that's kind of funny. Just shows you the, uh, the volatility of tournaments, if you will. Uh, you're only supposed to cash in like one out of seven tournaments. And um, so you're going to see an in-depth hand analysis of the Big O. Uh, and let me know what you guys think. Let me know in the comments if you guys like this. Also, at the end, I do kind of a, a little bit of a summary. I've been here for a whole week, kind of grinder's life. I know I've done that before in the past. Let me know if you guys like that as well. Um, so if you haven't already, hit the like and subscribe. I'm sure I'm going to ask you guys to do that probably one more time in the video. Go ahead and uh, share it. Uh, we're over 3,000 subscribers. My goal for the end of uh, 2023 is hopefully to be up to 10,000 subscribers. I think that's a reasonable goal, um, considering we're getting about 10 new subscribers a day. And thank you all for being subscribers. And uh, yeah, let me know if you guys like some of the uh, shenanigans that go on, because uh, obviously with Wayne and I traveling together, there may be more shenanigans coming up and maybe even another uh, uh, showing of Flounder or maybe Brent Francis or something to that effect. But in any case, let me know what you guys think about the video overall. And uh, if you guys like this format where I pause it and go into a, a full minute or minute and a half, I know it makes the videos a little bit longer, but um, it does give you guys a little bit more insight of what I was thinking with the dynamics of the table and stuff like that. So let me know what you think. I do my best, everybody. So, as always, enjoy the video and play smart and run like a god. So here we've got the professor, we've got Donkfish, uh, and then we have Flounder. Yeah, baby! He's never played an Omaha tournament. He's going to buy into the $600 Limit Omaha High Low. Very first time. It's like 5 in the morning. Tournament, can go wrong? tournament starts in 6 hours, and this is pregame. This is going to be hilarious when this guy wins this tournament. Yes. Uh, yeah, so we're going we're gonna to see. What's, exactly. what's, what's the rule, bro? What's the rule, Flounder? The rule is you just fake it until you make it. That's what I just don't want to win. Either that or 3-2. So 3-2 three, two, rule, 3-2 three, two, two, rule. All right, everybody. Play smart. Run like a god. Probably should check in with Flounder. How are, how are you doing, Flounder? 31k. Flounder is beating the PLO professor right now. He has 31k. Um, I'm at the right table. I can run it up. How about you? Are you at the right table? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and unfortunately, Donkfish is out of the tournament, but uh, Flounder beat Donkfish. So, very first yes. tournament. How do you feel about that? Pretty good. Good. All right. Play smart, everybody. Run like a god. All right, Flounder, tell me your theories on Ultimate Texas Hold'em versus poker tournaments. Okay. The theory for Ultimate Texas Hold'em is simple. Yes. You just play it, and you're going to be better off than you are if you go to a poker tournament. <laughs> That's just the bottom line, because poker tournaments, they take a shitload of time. You got whatever you want. to. You can sit there for hours and not even fucking cash. <laughs> but with Texas Ultimate Hold'em... You can, hey, you can, you can make it big anytime. And, and now let's take a moment to appreciate Flounder's perspective because clearly he is not a grinder. His perspective is you're better off playing the table games because you find out whether or not you win or lose the $600 uh, as fast as you do and you can do other fun stuff during Vegas. And you've played how many poker tournaments in your life? Two. Yeah. Okay. So good, good, solid advice here from Flounder. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we're going to go play some Ultimate Texas Hold'em now and see how we do. Yeah. So hopefully the next time the, everybody sees you, you're going to be up like $10,000.
Oh, at least. Oh, okay. Definitely. All right. So Flounder and I are on our way to find an Ultimate Texas Hold'em table. I've Wait. never played Ultimate Texas Hold'em winner. So mid update for the vlog, you got quad sixes. Quad sixes. Quad sixes. sixes. Poker, like I told him, don't play tournaments, boys and girls. Stick to the table. All right, so doing an in-depth analysis of some hands, this is literally like one of the first hands that I got to play at the 2 5 10, uh, Big O game, which runs every Friday at the win at like 1 o'clock. Now I look down at a hand, I have 4 8 10 jack queen double suited, I have three spades and two diamonds in my hand, and on the board there's two spades and one diamond, so I actually have queens and fours with a jack high flush draw. There's seven people who called going into the flop, so we've got a pot of $70 pre-flop. Now the first gentleman bets out exactly half pot. Now a couple things should happen here. One, he's betting exactly half pot. He's probably an experienced PLO player. Make a little mental note of that. That's what you should be doing when you're playing. So we go four ways to the turn. Because he bet half pot, usually that signifies that he's on some kind of draw. Now when the turn comes a king of diamonds, he ends up betting half pot again. He bets exactly 110. So now we've got to go in the tank and say, okay, the king of diamonds, did it really help him? What exactly is he betting half pot with? Keep in mind, now we have the second nut flush draw with the diamonds, and we have the third nut flush draw with spades. We also have two pair queens and fours, and we have an open-ended straight draw. So we have a ton of equity in this pot, but what is he betting a half pot size bet with? He's got to have some kind of draw as well. I'm thinking he's probably got like ace three five with ace high spades. He could have like ace deuce five with ace high spades, but he's got to have some kind of combo draw. So because of his bet sizing and his position, uh, he's been telling the story that he's on a draw. Uh, and so far I'm believing that he's on a draw, but our hand just has too much equity that we can't fold. Now we could raise here, which would be a little crazy, uh, but this is one of the first hands in the whole session. So I just decided to flat. But in this situation, we end up getting uh, four ways going into the river. And uh, lo and behold, the river is my gin card. So it's the nine of hearts. Now the first player ends up firing out $500. Uh, and let's just pause this for a minute and figure out what is the first player betting $500 with. Now, obviously you could say he's got 10 jack. Okay, what are some of the other hands that he could have? So he could have pocket kings. Uh, he could also have pocket queens, even though he blocked pocket queens. He could also have blockers as well. He could have something like ace jack jack with ace of high spades, even though the initial better was signifying that they had uh, a good draw. So these are all things that when somebody bets, even though it's obvious that they could have the nuts and it's obvious I do have the nuts and obviously I'm going to raise, but these are situations when you don't have the nuts, you got to put yourself in and ask, what do they have? Because there's going to be times when you don't have the nuts and you have, for example, like a set of queens and you might have to call in this situation. So when he bets 500, obviously I'm pretty excited about it. I'm going to double check my cards that I do have the stone cold nuts because it's a significant bet. I end up raising just a big stack of black, and it gets back to him, and he quickly mucks. So we end up scooping a nice big pot here. So I'm using this hand as an example to demonstrate what a possible leak might be in your PLO 8 or Big O game. So in this situation, we have deuce 3, 7, 10 jack with two clubs. 
again, I play a very wide variety of hands in Big O. My VPIP is probably around 85-90%. So I understand that there's going to be some people who say this is a terrible hand to play, but in my situation, my overly aggressive style, I play almost every single hand. So the board comes 4, 6, 8 with two clubs. Now let's pause it here for a minute because you guys can see me betting $25 here. I'm doing this for a couple of different reasons. One, if somebody has the not low, I'm going to hear from them. If they have ace deuce, I'm going to hear from them. Two, if they have 5-7, I'm most likely going to hear from them. Three, if I don't hear from any of them and everybody just calls, I know that my draws are actually live. Now, what draws do we have? We have the nut low draw with the deuce three, and I know some people are going to laugh at that, but deuce three is a nut low draw if an ace peels off. We have a straight draw with three seven and a straight draw with seven ten, and we have baby clubs. So basically at this point, I'm just trying to feel out the board. Now, keep in mind, we have six-way action. So $25 bet is not a huge bet. It signifies to everybody that I'm on some kind of draw. Now we end up eliminating two players. We go four ways to the turn. So for 25 bucks, I think that's a pretty good investment. Now the turn comes the king of diamonds. Now we still have a straight draw. All the same draws we still have. So we're not really going anywhere. So the first player leads out and bets $45. And at this point, he's acknowledging based on his bet sizing that he has some kind of draw he might have the nut low currently he might have ace deuce he might have ace three uh not really sure he could have bigger clubs at this point i'm basically putting him on bigger clubs and possibly a low uh like an ace deuce or an ace three he probably has ace three because it's an uncomfortable bet for him so we end up going four ways to the turn so basically we're just building a pot now the river comes and ace of diamonds now that counterfeits all low draws out there now i do have the nut low and i have absolutely nothing for the high the only thing i really have for the high is a jack of diamonds blocking uh the second nut flush draw because there's ace king six of diamonds out there so let's pause this for a minute so you can see i bet 300 dollars with absolutely just the nut low but if you have a leak in your game where you're a big o player and you arrive at this situation with the nut low and you end up checking it you're missing out on a lot of opportunities yeah there are going to be times where you are going to get quartered where ace deuce three is going to call you or king deuce three is going to call you and you're going to get quartered and sometimes you just have to take that chance but on a pot like this, or any size pot for that matter, when you bet close to pot $300, you're acknowledging to your opponent, who might have deuce three, that if they have like deuce three, four, and that's it, they might end up folding. And the reason why is because they don't want to get quartered. They know by calling $300, they're basically giving up $150 instantaneously. So it's important that when you arrive at this situation, that you apply pressure and either do a full-size pot bet or close to a full-size pot bet, signifying strength to get your opponents to fold. On the flip side, we have nothing on the high. So if everybody folds, this is good because we end up scooping and we end up not chopping the pot anyways so as you can see the first two people fold and the third player releases and we end up scooping so one of the first things I try to do when I find a new student or a new student finds me is I try identifying what leaks are in their game because usually if you can plug their leaks it's a sure way to make sure that they're going to end up being profitable in the long run. So this is a, a, a video of an example of a possible leak that you may have while playing Big O and I'll get into that in just a minute. So we look down at A3610 Jack. So we have three to Broadway, two to a wheel, and then we have a six dangler. We end up making it $30. We only get three callers, so we're going four ways to the flop. Now let's pause this here just for a quick minute to talk about this for a second. When somebody raises pre-flop, they're signifying that they have both a high and a low hand, and they have no medium cards. Usually the only people who are going to call in big O are people who have similar hands that are going to be both high and low. So when you have a flop like 8-10 queen, it's usually going to miss everybody who called going to the flop. So in a situation like this arises, it's very important that one, if you have good position, you can take advantage of the situation, and two, if no one shows any uh, willingness to want to take the pot, you can actually take the pot. So here on the flop, it checks around. Uh, all we have at this point is we have a pair of tens, we do have a gutter ball with ace jack, we do have a gutter ball with ten jack in case a nine peels off. Now an eight peels off pairing the board. So the first two players check and it's going to get back to me and you're going to see me do something unusual. 
first of all, betting is not unusual for me. But here's what we're doing here. We're taking a stab at the pot because it's unlikely of eight is in either of our first two opponents' hands. They both checked. If they had an eight, we would have heard from them by now. The person behind us could have a dangling eight, but we're just going to take that chance. They only have five cards, and there's two eights out of the deck already. So we're going to end up betting 125. And I know some of you might be thinking, this is not a very big pot, Professor. This is a $125 pot. What gives here? Why the intimate detail on this particular hand? Think about it in big blinds for example this pot is $125 there is nine big blinds there that I did not put in that pot so that's $90 if we're trying to make $90 an hour this whole pot can be an entire hour's worth of work for us so we end up betting $125 the person behind us ends up folding fairly quickly, and then the other two players fold, and we end up scooping a pot. Now, even though it's a small pot, these pots do add up in the long run and can be a big difference in your game. So here's an example of a hand that I do not recommend if you're first starting off in Big O, uh, but if you are, if you've if you've got some experience, I don't mind people playing hands like this. Again, my VPIP level is very, very large. So 6, 7, 10, queen, king is obviously not a monster hand. But the reason why I play hands like this is because if they do hit one-way hands, uh, they end up paying off pretty big because I like playing for an entire pot. I don't like playing for half a pot. So the initial raiser makes it 30. I end up calling. It goes around the table, and somebody puts in... A, a re-raise, a three bet to like $160. Now, the only reason why I called this is because I'm on the button. The other thing that I want to point out here real quick, the person who three bet and made it $160 happens to be a shorter stack. Uh, there's a few times where the guy's three bet and I've ended up mucking the cards uh, going against him where if he had a proper stack, I would end up calling. In this situation, he decides to jam, rip it all in. And now here's our pickle. Ace-5-6 is out there on the board. And they happen to be ace-high clubs. We actually have the king-high clubs in our hand. So we are drawing to the nut high. Now with ace-5-6 being on the board, half the pot's already gone. You have to assume somebody is going to have the nut low. Now what the book will tell you is in a situation like this, you should just muck your hand. Matter of fact, the book will tell you if the flop comes deuce-5-8 and you have a set of eights, you should muck your hand. And I know that sounds like a shocker, especially coming from somebody who has such a high V-pip. But the reason why the book says you should muck your hand, if even if you flop the nut high and there's a low out there, is because you're only playing for half the pot. And if you're only playing for half the pot, you essentially have to risk twice as many chips as everybody else in order to acquire the same amount of chips. So the risk-reward benefit just, quite frankly, really isn't there. But in this situation, I'm on the button. The host let me sit in for him specifically because he knows that, uh, one, I'm going to advertise the game. Two, I'm good for the game on the action. And I was also up on the list. It was really nice for the host to, to, to do that for me. So when the first player goes all in and we end up getting a caller, at this point I'm thinking to myself, well, if I call here for 175 it might go check, check all the way down because there's so much money in the pot already. Uh, or 325, pardon me. So I decided to call 325. And I'm thinking with one player all in, it's just going to be a dead side pot. So it really should go check all the way around. Now the turn gives turns up a queen. Now I actually have queens and sixes. And I have the nut flush draw. I don't have any low. This player decides to go all in. And this is just a bad situation that you, you don't want to be in. You're sitting there with two pair, nut flush draw. I actually have a gutter ball to a straight as well with 10 king. And so here I am sitting, arriving at this decision where it's like, great, it's $400. And I know I can only win half the pot or ends up being $500. Now, at this particular junction, when this gentleman makes it $500 and he's all in, I'm trying to put him on a hand. Like, why are you raising his all in bet? Uh, do you have some kind of free roll on me? Do you have like deuce three, four, deuce three, four with clubs? Those are reasonable hands to raise with. So the dealer's got to figure out the pot here for a minute because the first player went all in for less. He went all in for like $100. And uh, 
so the second player ends up applying max pressure to me and uh kudos to him he ended up being a really good player uh because he's applying max pressure he's applying all the same principles that you should be applying to in big o now the river comes a six at the particular time i did not realize i had queens and sixes i did not realize i rivered a full house uh so the player literally goes all in for nine hundred dollars at this point in time i'm like oh my god that's the worst card i wanted to see i'm like now i have trip sixes i did not realize i had a queen in my hand and I'm sitting here going, I'm about to call off $1,000 with just trip sixes. Now, here's the kicker. I should be winning the high pot, all the side pot action, a decent amount of the time. Because the original uh, short stack, three bet, re-raised all in, or almost all in, pre-flop, for like $125 or $175. So... As far as removing full houses, he should be the only one that has a hand like aces full. So at this point in the in the hand, I should be the only one with three sixes. And this guy, literally, he bet $980, and I'm like, Jesus. I'm like, why would you ever do that? Even if you have deuce three, aren't you afraid of me quartering you? And, you know, you have to show some appreciation for players who will put you uh, on the spot and apply pressure to you. It just shows that they're good big o players and i'm not saying the rest of the players at the table were not good big o players i'm just saying that this particular player uh in particular happens to be a good big o player because he's applying max pressure ultimately while going into the tank i keep thinking why is he betting pot when the side pot is so you know is is a thousand dollars he's betting a thousand dollars and this is when i look down at my hand and i realize oh shit i don't have just a six i have sixes full of queens so then i snap call him and tell him and he shows me he had deuce three i think he had deuce three four so he was actually free rolling to any straight card that was not a club so we end up chopping the side pot we end up chopping the main pot uh and the original short stack who jammed did not have pocket aces he had some kind of combo draw where he had uh, like ace, jack, deuce, three, as you can see right there. So I'm actually going to get half of the main pot where the other guy is going to get quartered. So we end up coming out quite a bit ahead in this hand, even though we took a really weird line with a really strange hand. This is something I would not recommend doing at all. Uh, and it just so happens that it worked out in our favor. But... Um, yeah, you could see the amount of pressure, even though I had a full house. Calling $1,000, you know, is not the easiest thing in the world when you acknowledge you're only playing for half the pot. So let's take a look at what we've got here. We've got ace, five, five, eight, eight. So we have pocket eights, pocket fives, and we have an ace. We have a suited ace. So this is a hand that I do raise. I do have two to the wheel. I'm also blocking a full wheel draw with pocket fives. And I have a suited ace. Again, my V-pip is really high. I play ultra aggression. So I make it $40. We end up getting three callers or two callers. So we're going three ways to the flop. We're in position. Now the flop comes 6-8 king. So let's pause it here for a minute. So here's a perfect example of a situation in which you flop middle set in which a lot of players might not know how to proceed. First of all, if you're three ways and you're in position and they check it to you, you should obviously bet pot. Not all the time, but for the majority of time. And, and the reason why is because so far you're scooping the pot. If somebody has a set of kings here, they're probably going to lead out and bet. They're going to bet because they don't want the low to get there. They don't want the straight to get there. They don't want a heart to get there. Basically, they're hoping for like running black nines, running black jacks, something to that effect. In your situation, since you have a set of eights, you want to basically apply the same amount of pressure. Now, in this situation, we do have ace five for a low. And I know what some people say. They're going to laugh at that and say ace five really isn't a low. Well, you know, if a deuce or a three comes up, it counterfeits any good or better low draw that we have so ace five is not really knocking uh a low at all and not only that but it's unlikely a five is going to come because you have two fives it's more likely like a deuce a three a four or a seven is going to come out there if an ace does come out there obviously that's going to be a really bad card for you but in a situation like this when you have middle set it's important that you start building a pot because if the board does come out like a six on the turn, you're probably going to get called off by somebody who has a dangling six. So in this situation, uh, both players check to me. I double check my cards, make sure what I have. Yes, I do have a set of eights. So I decide to fire out. 
one black chip, $100. Now it's $100 into about a $130 pot or so, so it's not a huge bet. But look at this, we end up getting callers. Now the turn comes a king, giving us a full house. Now we can proceed with a little bit of caution here because it is five card, big O, so there is a possibility somebody can have king X in their hand. They can definitely have king deuce three. So I end up betting $300 and I get one guy who snap calls me real quick. This usually when they snap call is going to signify that they have like a nut low draw, possibly with a heart, something to that effect. Now when the river comes out a deuce, let's pause this for a minute. So the river comes out a deuce, which actually improves our hand quite significantly because before we were drawing to an ace five low and ace deuce was beating us, deuce three was beating us, deuce four was beating us. And now all of a sudden our ace five low has improved quite dramatically because if somebody was drawing, like when he snapped called my $300 bet with a paired board, it signified that he probably had a low draw with hearts. Now in this situation, I should acknowledge that I'm pretty much scooping the high unless he randomly wakes up with king deuce, which I'm going to find out on the river if he either A, leads, or if he check pots it. But in a situation like this, I'm not going to think he's going to do either one of those situations. So we have to factor that there's a good amount in the pot right now. Uh, we have nearly $900 in the pot, and we want to get the maximum amount that we can get called by with either a worse low or maybe just a dangling king. So we have to find an appropriate amount to bet here. So at this point I bet another $300. I do it strictly for value and I tell him that this is my please call me bet. Now this is a situation where I in hindsight, I probably could have applied max pressure and bet 900 just to take the pot. He ends up snap calling me and all he had was an ace five low. So we actually are going to get three quarters of this pot where had I bet a full pot size bet, um, you know, I might have scooped the whole pot instead. So as you can see, it was a, a decent amount. And uh, yeah, it's not bad to get three quarters of a nice big pot like that with all them black chips in there. So here's an example of a hand in which one of the tightest players is going to bet out and how do you play against a really tight player this is a question that comes up a lot particularly in big o so the gentleman in the last seat in the nine seat that you can see right next to the dealer hasn't played very many hands it's been pretty obvious that when he's involved in the hand he plays him pretty strong so he's very very tight very very aggressive so now the board comes out three six king i look down at my hand and i've got ace king eight nine Four. So I have second to low draw. I have a pair of kings. I do have a diamond draw here, but here's the key. He's not betting a full-size pot. He's betting $35. And in a situation like this, when a really tight, aggressive player bets something like half pot, it shows that they're uncomfortable with the hand. And not only that, it shows that they're on a draw. So in this situation, any other player here, I would probably raise because I have top pair, top kicker, second not low draw. I do have a diamond draw. But in this situation, I decide to flat because I want to see what happens and develops on the turn. Now the turn comes out a black seven, seven of clubs. I do have a four five blocker with a four in my hand. But look, the tightest player on the table or one of the tightest players bets out $60. Now just the way he held the chips and just the way he hesitated and just the way he bets, shows me he's uncomfortable with his hand and shows me he's uncomfortable with his bet sizing. If you have the tightest guy on the player on the table who tends to bet really big pot size bets when they have made hands, what is he doing right here? He's doing a blocker bet. So when he's doing a blocker bet like this, I acknowledge that and I realize, okay, he's either got ace four or he has the nut diamond draw, maybe with ace four, maybe ace five with nut diamonds. So in this situation, I go ahead and raise. Now, even though he's the tightest player on the table or one of the tightest players, I know he's completely uncomfortable with his hand. If he wasn't, he would have done a full pot size bet. One, he did a value bet. Two, the way he handled his chips just told me that he was not comfortable with his hand. Now that I'm putting the pressure on him, because I'm thinking my king is probably good, because I've got ace king, my ace four might be good. He could be contemplating ace four with nut diamonds here. But because he is a super tight player, I'm going to put him to the test, and I'm going to find out if he wants to run with his hand or or get rid of it. And he could call here and we could see what develops on the, on the river, but I wanted to show this hand of what to do when you have somebody who's really tight and they're not doing a full pot size bet. Usually if you play back at them, they'll end up mucking.
This is a quick example of a hand where there's a high risk, high reward play, and sometimes it pays off and sometimes it doesn't. We look down at Jack Jack 7 7 Deuce. We are on the button. Jack Jack 7 7 Deuce, by no stretch of the imagination, is a monster big O hand. By no stretch of the imagination am I telling people you should be coming in with a raise for it. But in a situation like this, when you're on the button, you have a high V pip, I have an image, I play it, and the flop comes Jack. 9-5, so we do flop top set here. So in a situation like this, I am on the button, checks to me, I decide to do a full pot size bet. Uh, we end up going to the turn. Now the turn comes, the deuce of spades. Let's go ahead and pause this for a second. So here we are with top set of jacks, but the board is deuce five, nine jack with two spades and two hearts. Literally, if you run through the whole deck, any card that does not pair the board puts out a straight draw. Ace, three, four, six, seven, eight, ten, queen, king. Any spade, any heart puts out a flush draw. So there's really no safe card except for the board pair. This is a situation in which you have top set, even on the button. One could make the argument that if you're a tight player, you could check back this situation because literally every river card changes what the nuts is. And Obviously, we, we want to deuce a five or a nine, but I just want to point this out because this is definitely a high risk, high reward situation where if you bet pot on the turn, you know your opponent's going to have a draw and you know if any draw gets there, if they lead out and bet pot, you're pretty much going to have to fold. Uh, so really, you're, you're betting for the board to pair or for it to go check check on the river. So when he checks it to me, I still have top set. I am going to bet 150 There's $155 into the pot. The guy goes in the tank a little bit and even asks, how much is in the pot? Now keep in mind, if you're the guy drawing in this situation, it only pays to draw if your opponent will pay you when you hit. Let me pause that for a minute. So I shouldn't say it only pays to... Uh, hit when you hit your draw if you're going to get paid off on your draw but when you're dealing with a high low game you have to keep in mind if you're drawing to the low and you hit your low it's only going to pay off if your opponent ends up calling or you can bet big enough to scoop the pot and get them off the hand same thing in a situation like this this board is so diverse any spade any heart anything that doesn't pair the board changes what the nuts are so it's only going to pay to call if you're on a draw if you believe your opponent has a strong enough hand to call when you do hit so let's go ahead and continue to see what happens on the turn or on the river so 125 we get two callers and uh, the turn or the river puts out a heart and it's a low card so now if you're the person who just drew to nut hearts and you have some type of low the best possible thing to do here is probably to bet half pot or to check it maybe about a third pot but here's another leak in a lot of big o players games when they hit their nuts they end up betting it big and they don't get paid off on it so let's see what happens with this individual when he hits obviously the stone cold nuts either on the low or on the heart he ends up doing a full pot size bet well that's going to get me out of the hand so I hope you guys are liking the in-depth analysis of Big O. If, uh, if you do, please leave me some comments down below. And if you haven't already, go ahead and hit the like and subscribe. Now we're going to pause this just for a minute. Now the flop comes 5-7 queen. And my reputation as a player who has a very high V-pip, uh, the table hasn't quite experienced that yet. And I mention that because early on in the session, people are still trying to feel other people out. And it's very common that people will misplay their hands. And it's important when you're trying to grind that you capitalize on those situations. So here's a situation where I have bottom two pair. I don't have any kind of substantial heart draw. And uh, so deuce three, five, seven, king, all I have is bottom two pair. And I do have a no low draw in case the ace comes out. So it checks to me, this is a limped pot, six players pre-flop, I bet half pot. Again, when you bet half pot, it signifies you're on some type of draw. Now I am on some type of draw. I'm on the nut low draw with deuce three, hoping an ace peels off, or I'm on a full house draw with five seven. So we end up getting two callers. So now there's $150 in the pot and the board, the turn comes a king. So when the turn comes a king, it's not a heart. It actually improves my hand to kings over. And it's one of those situations where now I have three pair. It is a dynamic board. Early on in the session, I don't want to juice up the pot because pretty much just like the very last hand, every card in the deck is going to change. 
what could be the nuts? Ace, Jack, 10, 9, 8, 6, 4, 3, or a deuce. All changes what could be the nuts. And then, of course, any heart out there. So in a situation like this, I am out of position, whereas the previous hand, I was in position. And when I'm out of position, I like to go ahead and check it, play a little tighter to the chest. Now, obviously, I'm not going to lay it down with three pair. But I just wanted to point out the differences between being in position and out of position on almost a, a similar hand as last time. So I end up checking it. The guy on the button ends up betting full-size pot, $150. Now the king should not have improved his hand whatsoever. So in my situation, this is going to make for a pretty easy call. I've got fives and kings. I go ahead and snap call. Now the river comes a five. So let's look at the dynamics and how the five changes what my opponent could have. Because keep in mind, my opponent's on the button. His range should be fairly wide. He could have sevens full here. He could have queens full here probably not have kings full because again i have a king in my hand so it's likely he's either got like queens full or he has some type of low hand or maybe he has like ace deuce five so i'm hoping that he's got like a dangling five of some sort so basically that's at this particular junction what i'm trying to target with my hand any other type of targeting uh, will end up backfiring. So I do have fives full of kings. So in this situation, I'm going to try targeting a dangling five. So there's $450 in the pot. I decided to go ahead and bet out $250. I figured if the guy's got ace x with five, he can go ahead and call because now he has trip fives with an ace. When he ends up making it 550, I am really not loving life. At this particular point in time, he raises an extra $300. It's a value raise. He's got to have queens full. It's the only thing that makes sense in his hand. I even say, say to him, I say, you must have queens full. Uh, and I'm like, I've got everything else. I've got five, seven, king. In this situation, though, I just felt like, you know, if he had queens full, he, if he had a set of queens, I probably would have heard from him on the flop. So there's a couple of things that you can take away from this hand, for example. When the guy makes it 550, he's either super nutted or has super air. Uh, there's really no reason for the guy to raise. Now, this is early on in the session, so there's two things to take from this. If the guy's super nutted and he's got queens full, congratulations, he's going to win another $300 from me. But on the flip side, if he has queens full, uh, you know, his his hand, his line does not make very much sense. Sure, a full pot size bet on the on the turn makes sense, and maybe he's playing a little tighter to the chest. But in all seriousness, if if he does have queens full, don't you think he should just do a full pot size bet? So take note of this. If you're in a situation where you're considering bluffing out a pot, make sure you do it with a full pot size bet. Yeah, it's a lot more chips for you to risk, but you must have to do it because if you're trying to value bluff for an extra $300, especially against a maniac like myself or somebody who's loose aggressive, I'm going to call. And I called expecting to fold, but it was 300 to win 1,000. He ends up showing ace, queen, deuce. Had he shown some aggression on the flop, he probably would have saved himself some money on this hand. So here's a fun hand where one of the biggest things in Big O is, of course, you always want to be drawing to scoop. You always want to draw for the whole pot. Yes, getting half the pot's important, So, but getting the whole pot obviously is twice as important. So we look down at ace, deuce, five, six, eight. Really good hand. We're taking this up on the flop because the flop ends up being deuce, three, eight. So I flop two pair with the second nut low. And I have a gutter ball. Obviously, if a four comes up, a four is my gin card with ace, five, six. And the fact that I have ace, deuce, five, six, eight, I flop two pair on this hand with second no, not low on a deuce, three, eight. I feel really good about the hand. So I lead out for 75. I get two callers. Now, when I get two callers, some alarm bells start peeling off because I'm like, okay, somebody could have a better low than me. Somebody could have a bigger high. So the turn card comes a nine. I end up checking it. It checks to the guy in position, and God bless him, he bets pot. He's doing what he should be doing, full pressure bet. So the river comes a 7. Now, in this situation, I do have a straight with the 5-6. If somebody's got 6-10 or 10-jack, they're going to have a bigger straight, but I also have second not low. So I'm really checking, particularly because I'm out of position. It checks to the guy who's in position who bets 1,300. I snap call because I made that decision before even bet. I'm like second not low and third not high. It's really hard for me to get scooped. And the other guy goes in the tank for a little bit. He ends up laying it down for $1,300. And uh, 
he says all he has is the low. He just has ace four, and then we have five six. So this is a hand that we're going to get chopped. Not a big hand, but I just wanted to show you guys how important position is, because had I had position on the turn, obviously I would have been driving this bus. So at the win, we have, this is actually a huge turnout. There's like 1,400 people for this fight, for all you Hold'em players, for all the people who play the real poker game. Uh, that's going to fire up in about 20 minutes, but flight number two has got 1,400. That's pretty big. Uh, played a little bit of cash this morning. Normally, I don't recommend playing cash when you're playing tournaments, but it starts at 5. Uh, it's in this morning for 2,000, out for 8,200. So we ended up booking a pretty nice win. Um, feeling pretty good about... Uh, uh, where we're at right now. Actually, in for 3000 pardon me, out for um, 8100 So yeah, up five grand. But yeah, we ended up booking a nice win this morning, playing some PLO, some Big O. They do have a 5510 Big O here at the win every Friday at one o'clock. Uh, the host is a super nice guy. Matter of fact, I was actually fourth on the list. They didn't call the list because the room is so busy. And... Um, uh, the host was willing, everybody just sat down while I was playing yep. PLO, and the host was good enough to stand up. So if you're in the win on Friday, big O, 5, 5, 10, every Friday at 1 o'clock, we'll see if we can get some other things going, but play smart, everybody. Run like a god. So uh, it's Saturday morning. I uh, really haven't given too many updates this week in Vegas. Uh, just been grinding, and, um, you know, one of the things about being a grinder and doing this for a living is the struggles of being away from family and um, you know making your most time of it and this is something that for those of us who do grind uh, you know we talk about a decent amount of time and it's just one of those things where I'm just like looking over my results and what's all occurred and uh, there's some things that I'd say that I love tournament poker, but then there's some things I'd say I'd absolutely hate tournament poker. And, you know, just giving you an idea, like, got here Sunday, today's Saturday, been here in Vegas for six days at the WPT at the win. It's been good, uh, but we fired six bullets, all for $600 a pop, and uh, have zero caches from them. So that's the horse and the 08 and uh, PLO5 and PLO Turbo. And uh, this is one of those things where I'm looking back at like this whole week and for this whole week, uh, I think I'm down $400 total uh, and that included a, a $200 loss or $180 loss just playing 816, just trying to have a relaxing time. Because sometimes when you're grinding and you're on the road all the time, you forget why you love the game of poker. So it's one of those things where anybody who's traveled with me knows from time to time um as crazy it might seem i like to go play some super low limits whether it's like three six or four eight you know just have fun and uh blow off some steam and you know if you lose 100 bucks doing it while doing it that's good because sometimes it can reset your mind and be like oh that's why i remember when i used to play four eight when i first started playing um how intense i felt every pot was for a four dollar and an eight dollar bet Whereas here I'm playing Palo in Omaha now and the swings aren't, you know, $100 here, $100 there. The swings are, you know, hey, I won 5000 on Friday morning or hey, I lost 4500 playing $25 double board bomb pot. So the swings are bigger. You just get used to them. Um, but it's, uh, it's funny how I'm looking back and reflecting on that, that, you know, uh, playing a 4A game to me, uh, or any type of limit game, which we did last night, is just really relaxing because there's not pressure of, oh my God, what's going to happen on this $2,000 pot? Now, is it boring? Yeah, for the most part. Um, I really like to have fun with it, though. Uh, I like to play incredibly loose, put some, you know, hold timers on tilt. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things that I'm the type of guy, if you're at grinding at 4.8 or 816 or whatever the case may be 612 that you want at the table because um yeah i do know what i'm doing but when it's lower stakes like that 
you know, if you're having fun with it, I'm not doing it to, to earn a living at that point. I'm doing it just to remind myself why I love the game. Because I tell you what, after you play for a whole week and been away from your family for a whole week, and whether you're even or lost money, it doesn't matter. Even if you only make like 500 bucks, you're like, wow, I could have stayed home and uh, done something more productive with my time than, than be away for like a whole week and either lose money or, or, uh, or make just a little bit. So today's kind of our last day. We've got the double board PLO Bomb Pod Tournament, which is every Saturday at MGM Grand. That's pretty cool. Then we're going to play the double board, double board Bomb Pod game afterwards. But um, yeah, it's one of those things. If, if, if you're on a poker trip and you find yourself, uh, you know, down, what you have to do is take everything you can from that and learn from it. Uh, or if you're on a poker trip and you've been away for like a week and you're even, uh, you know, you still have to take all your experiences from it, reflect, say, okay, what could I have done differently? Um, you know, and uh, uh, how can I optimize my time more effectively? So that's about it. I mean, this is, this is a grinding life, you know. Some weeks I go away and come back with less money. There's not a lot of professions you can do that with. And then some weeks I go away and I come back with a lot more. So the Double Board Bomb Pop um, tournament should be fun. Uh, it did say that there is uh, a re-entry, and if you enter by level one, you get an extra 5,000 in chips. So I'm really going to implement a few um, of my theories on Double Board Bomb Pots, specifically just on positioning. And uh, I guess what I'm going to call is the pickle, uh, putting the pickle under pressure or something else under pressure, maybe the egg. I don't know. I haven't figured out the right term, but right now pickle seems to, to stick because the person who's in between, the last person who bets and the last person who might call, they're really in a pickle. So I think we just need to call them pickle. But yeah, that's about it, everybody. I think I'm going to go play some uh, PLO at the win this morning. Um, just have a nice relaxing time. Still do a max buy-in, but... Um, you know, I think I'm going to play a lot tighter than I normally do. I don't know if that's possible, but uh, I'm going to see what I can make happen this morning. See if I can book a little like $500, $600 win before we go um, and play that double board bomb pot game. But uh, yeah, that's about it, everybody. Play smart. I like a god.